welcome to the Explorers podcast. I'm Michelle Martin and together with my husband David we present new weekly episodes focusing on all things outdoors, camping and overlanding, people, places and mapping. For those of you new to Explore Oz, our website is www.exploreoz.com. Our app is called Explore Oz Traveller, which you can check out on the app stores available for all platforms. Our podcast is not just about tech and maps, it's also about sharing beautiful places in our country. We chat with travel community and we want to learn from one another. We want to introduce to you living the adventurous lifestyle and hopefully you'll find it inspirational. Subscribe to the podcast, tune in weekly as we bring you stories, insights and tips from extensive four-wheel drive explorers. Explorers is more than a channel, it's a journey. So gear up for another episode and let's explore together. Well, welcome back everybody. Wow, it seems like it's been forever since we've uh, sat in front of the camera and had a recording for you to listen to and or watch on the YouTube and podcast channels. But this would be uh, podcast number 11 and we're kind of calling this Around Australia 2024. Um, what we wanted to try and cover off is why we're here, what we're doing, uh, our trip planning to get started, and the first part of our journey that gets us over from Perth to Sydney. So, you know, last year, last year we decided we did a trip through the central deserts and um, and and WA and the coast of WA or the centre of WA, going up Newman Way and everything. We had such a great time, you know. We've been trying to plan for years as to how to take the business on the road and work remotely and that sort of thing and we sort of threw last year's trip in as a as a as a bit of a test and what did we do three months two months okay. three months three months through winter uh that was 22 um that wasn't last year now uh but that was a, that was seems like forever ago but that was a a three month trip to sort of shake down our set up and to work out what we had right and what we had wrong and we learned all sorts of lessons about communications and telephone service providers and and uh, all those sorts of things so it was amazing to I just got bitten by an ant ow oh, oh. <laughs> the ow. joys of working the joys in of the working bush. in the bush without my Live. boots on gee that hurt I hope it was an ant um oh. yeah there it is down there like a moth oh. might have been a wasp oh. no it's that ant there okay <laughs> I hope. Wow, that's stinging. Um, wildlife. Wildlife. Poor. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's made it a bit hard. But anyway, we'll keep going. So we did this trip and we learnt uh, all sorts of uh, lessons, as I say, about all the providers and what to do with our phones. And, you know, we decided we needed Starlink to do our communication systems and we needed better internet. Uh, we decided also that, that the camper trailer that we also had was... Uh, was whilst it was an ultimate camper and the camper behind me is another ultimate camper it was the older model and it had a manual lifter and some bits and pieces and that wasn't as suitable for me and my backs and back problems and stuff so for multi months once it like it's perfect for shorter trips yeah it was great and fine for for a few weeks but if we we're going to go for six nine or twelve months you know it, it wasn't going to be a hundred percent practical and also that we had to take our bikes on and off the roof our mountain bike yeah. uh, each day to lift it when we found the the new ultimate um <clears throat> when we found that we took the old ultimate in for a checkup and and we saw the new ultimate at, at the same time and we looked at the electric lifter feature and that sort of stuff and the fact that we could put much more weight on the <clears throat> on the roof of it and be able to um lift it uh, with the bikes and everything on without having to take them off each day that was a a massive selling feature um and also obviously all new modern bits and pieces and all new mod cons that the older camper didn't have like like heaters and hot water and all that sort of stuff and running showers and all the things that we've now got in this one so just upping the comfort level yeah increasing the comfort level a bit a little <laughs> um yeah if any of you've been listening to the podcast you would have heard about the early days when it was um pretty basic which like lots of people when you're young that's how you start out and uh yeah, we're getting older now, so <laughs> the appeal of being on the road for at least a year for this, this trip that we've been planning for quite a few years, um, the reality of that last trip in 2022 for three months made me particularly realise I needed a few more creature comforts. I used to be able to go for a very long time without a shower and just do the basics, you know, A, P and C, um, and a little bit of, you know, 
baby wipes and that type of thing, that just becomes a little bit more challenging after months. Um, and we don't tend to go to caravan parks, so we aren't having the luxury of uh, going to showers. And because we choose to tow such a small camper trailer, it doesn't have an onboard, ensuite indoor shower like um, people with the big caravans do. So just trying to find our balance between what was practical for the type of touring we would like to do and what is comfortable for the type of cleanliness that we desire and the comforts that we desire is, is how we decided to make that decision to buy this new uh, 2023 model GT Ultimate Camper behind us. And um, that sort of really brings us to why our trip is really only beginning in 2024. <laughs> because when we ordered it, it was actually 2022 Two. in October. And uh, it's... November was the show. Yeah, October we started trying to order it. Yeah, we went to the Perth show. Um, we started trying to order it before the show. And then, yeah, the no November Perth um, Caravan and Camping show was where we were able to actually see the model and make a few final decisions about the options and what we wanted to do. Um, won't go into a long story about that because buying an ultimate, you have lots of options, but pretty much the base is the same. And it was, a, and anyway, as I said, I won't go into detail. It's basically so, a matter as to how you put the options together yeah. as to how much wallet you need to have. That's the <laughs> and, and then adjusting your, your, uh, requirements to suit your wallet becomes the, becomes the value, becomes the proposition. Yeah. And so anyway, we placed our order. Uh, in November, I think the final order after one order and changing it and then placing another one. And so we had the order in, in November and, you know, we had kind of a, a July time frame for the bill to be completed, which sounded all perfect. So July we, 23 was July what 23. we were aiming on for our getaway for this traveling around for yeah, a year. And we'd, and we'd basically been making plans and, you know, travel planning is always a uh, is a bone of contention. Some people love to plan. Some people hate to plan. Some people plan and some people don't plan. We, we're kind of the not planners once we're actually traveling, but when you're trying to work out the business position and how we would be with our releases of the products, um, you know, we don't try to over, we don't try to publish new versions of the apps and things over the primary travel seasons from, you know, um, April, May to, to sort of September, October. We try and hold off on any, any updates at all. Um, to make sure that we don't have any problems with people out in the bush. Um, you know, so, and then working out how we were going to deal with our map updates for whether it was going to be a 2024 release or whether we were going to hold off and would we do it before we started or after we started. And so we basically made the business plans that had sort of said, okay, we'll get updates done till uh, the July timeframe. We'll get ourselves in a position to travel uh, straight across and up towards the top of Queensland or up into, you know, northern Queensland was our original plan. Through the outback. Through the outback, yeah. of course. And then we were going to come down, you know, the Great Dividing Range through Queensland into New South Wales as our mapping research project. So we would get, you know, a few months of mapping updates and things done into the last year schedule so that the Topo 2024 uh, release product would have a whole load of, you know, upper Queensland, New South Wales uh, updates that we were going to be able to put into the system. Um, and that was basically the loose plan we had right up until delivery date, I think, of the camper trailer sometime in July when I hadn't heard a thing and I contacted uh, Ultimate wondering where it was. And it hadn't actually been finished being built, let alone being shipped to Perth at that point. So um, it, it, it got finished being built and then it got shipped over to Perth. And I think the time frame became August or September for that, I think, wasn't it? Yes. So it kept shifting so when you rang them on the original delivery date in july it was they said finished. it was still in the factory it was two weeks behind as were all the others and then they told us that it was going to come on a container from because they're built in new south wales in maroo it was going to be shipped on a container we didn't know how long that meant what that meant they then explained that it would come to the dock in Fremantle, go through uh what do they call it? Quarantine customs? No, no, it doesn't need that to come from Sydney. Something but it, was it gonna, had to do. It, it had, had to, to get on shipped the to the warehouse, and then uh, it was going to arrive. Um, yeah, it was September. Well, I, I know what we wanted to do was on the, the camper get done, all yeah. this yeah. branding done, which we'd also had done on the four wheel drive, which 
people that have been following in our channel for a while would, would have seen that we've been um, putting photos of the vehicle and the camper up. So that's all been a wrap. And obviously they take about three days to do a wrap of this size and, um, you know, doing all the artwork, but that's one thing. But the next part was actually getting the scheduling, the timing to put it in with the guys at Perth Graphic Centre who did the wrap. And they anyway, were awesome. to, cut, to cut a long story short, <laughs> Perth Graphic, yep, they've got, they've got Perth Graphic Centre in, they did a great job with all of our stuff but you know getting the camper out because we didn't actually take ownership and we'd had three or four different bookings because you know shifting it from july to august september october whatever month it was exactly now i could look up the invoices but you know by the time the camper trailer became available for us to actually get a hold of to take uh, we'd had three different adjustments within two weeks of the of the wrap and that was becoming an issue for the guys at, at the wraps place so we ended up being able to drive over to pick up the ultimate, put trade plates on it because we hadn't had it handed over or had any details. In fact, I don't think I'd even paid for it at the time. And we whipped it off to the uh, wrap shop and, and, and had the wrap done um, and then took it back to ultimate. There was still some issues or ultimate in, in WA. There were still some issues um, that we found at the time and it had to go back so that all of those things could be finished off because it didn't actually come with all the bits that we kind of expected. So, you know, there was, there was quite a series of dramas and by the time we actually got the camper in October, late October. We went away for Leon's birthday in October. Yeah, so the for end of October. Trip, yeah. That was our first shakedown trip and that was about around about the 23rd or yep. 23rd of October. Yeah. Um, and so we took it out for two or three days, found a few more things and had to go back to Ultimate for a few more bits and pieces. <laughs> and then it was another two weeks or so and we got it back. and. During this time, you know, obviously all our plans of that great Queensland down the coast, do the mapping, get all up to date, get to Sydney for Christmas with the families, um, that had all um, completely changed because the reality was we didn't have a camper. We'd we gone from have, a winter departure trip had, to a summer departure And now it was trip. coming into summer. So the, the complexities as to what we would do, we, we had had thoughts about doing a Tasmania um, a, a start-up, so do Christmas drive drive for the Sydney Christmases and do a Tasmania um, adventure as the first part but then we couldn't get bookings on the boat uh, the spirit of Tasmania boat for weeks you, Michelle tried a number of times to get us on the boat um, and we just weren't getting any success then after we finally got the camper November time frame um, early November she just happened to have another look at the spirit of Tasmania website and managed to, to secure a booking for mid-January. So we had some dates. Mid-January, we were going to stay for six weeks. We'd be coming out the end of February. We were a bit nervous about two weeks in Tassie and school holidays, but um, we figured it was better to be you know, somewhere nice in Tassie than trying to hack through New South Wales or the, or, or the more populated areas. So the, the, the plan had happened, and <clears throat> what was it two or three days after that, we basically made the full plans and we were almost ready, packed up to... Uh, Nothing like a to last start, minute panic. To and a start plan. heading out, but having said that, five minutes to pack up, we left on the 10th of December. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. All things being equal, we had a lot of things to finish off in the house. We had to tidy up the business. We had to tidy up the kids. You know, we had yeah. uh, a fair, a fair few things to do to get to the point where we actually were able to leave on the 10th of December. Um, so obviously, you know, the plans of all the business operations and things that we were planning to do all had a massive time shift and um, you know that's trip planning uh, our style anyway it's just <laughs> wing it day well, by day uh, yeah. as, as as you come along and do stuff yeah, it's so, not just like having um, annual leave or long service leave or quitting your job or something actually having to know that you've got to keep the business running um, and be able to be effective the whole time um, the customer service has got to be ongoing because we don't have any staff. So the whole sales process, um, there's a few back-end things that we do. Um, so management of that, making sure that that was tickety-boo. Um, they're sort of the big concerns that we have on, on our trip. And a lot of people think the grass is always green and how wonderful to be able to travel and work. But there's some really significant infrastructure issues. Um, and as, as, as David's already alluded to with the comms and all, that, that has that has caused us a few hiccups along the way. Um, 
but there's no need to go into detail about that now anyone anyone that's on the road traveling with communications has half a clue if you can just imagine what it's like we just cannot have a black spot and obviously we travel to black spots so the starlink is a godsend we couldn't have done this a few years ago without the starlink that's making a huge difference and um you can continue on from there oh i know you're ready to say something i, I wasn't really <laughs> i was just about to say that thank goodness now the pain in my foot from the ant thing earlier <laughs> oh is that what it just was dissipated yes i was just realizing that i could actually feel my toes again um so there you go. Yeah, setting up all sorts of stuff, the comms and the rear of the car, and because we wanted to make a few changes. Living on the road for a long time, um, we've done it before. We kind of, we, we did it in the 98 to 99, 2000 timeframes. We traveled consistently for a couple of years back then. So we'd had half a clue, but gee, that was a long time ago. And things have changed a lot. You know, now the complexities of traveling and carrying a Starlink antenna and and a, and a set of poles to put it up a bit higher above the tree lines and, and those sorts of things is, you know, a technical challenge that's a bit different than what we used to have. Also the battery systems and then trying to manage power, um, you know, and trying to make sure we've got enough power to run our computer systems and the comms equipment and the telephone systems and all of those bits and pieces. Um, it does add, it does add a lot of um, complexity and, and, and thought processes, how many solar panels do I have to have out, how many of this do we need. We don't use generators, don't believe in them. I think they're just noisy, disgusting pollution creating devices. So, you know, to to have to be set up to actually make this work does, does take a long time. So day we left, you know, tenth of December. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't really, as usual, we didn't have too much of a plan. I, I do recall that we we got in the car and we'd had a thought we we always like to go a different way as many times as possible, but how many different ways can you go across the air highway? Um, believe it or not, there's quite a number of ways from east to west, and we've done them all. Um, but you know, um, west to east and east to west. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Either <laughs> both, both ways. Yep. Thank you for correcting me there. Um, we both go. You know, we we have tried to do various different things. So this time we 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 decided instead of doing our usual. Um, saying we try and do it differently all the time. Hyden, Northman Road, uh, we tried to do something a little bit different. Yeah, the goal was let's avoid Norseman. Let's see, can we get to the air highway from Perth without actually going to Norseman? And so the Hyden, Norseman Road obviously takes you to Norseman, so we didn't want to do that. And um, so there was a bit of a loose plan that we might go down towards Esperance and then come back up the, um, is it Dunn's Track? Yeah. And come up that way. And then before getting to Norseman off the Duns track, actually head out onto a track again that we have done before, which some of you that are into four-wheel driving would know this, the Overland Telegraph track, which runs parallel to the air highway, but south of it, and you pick it up just south of Norseman. So that was the beginning of the plan on day one. And then somewhere along the way... But we also, we also leaving on the 10th, you know, we had to realise that we needed to be in Sydney around about the 21st to the 22nd. So because we wanted to be there a few days before Christmas, touch up, catch up with different members of the family um, before Christmas, have one of our kids come over um, to be with us for Christmas. So we wanted to get there fairly early and look, 10 to 11 days traveling from Perth to Sydney for us is, well, that's fast, right? We don't like to travel that fast, why should you? Um, but that's because we, although we spend all day on the road, we're actually stopping and starting yes. and taking photos and documenting because yeah. we're doing all the POI updates of every single rest area, every single possible camp out the back of the rest area. Does it exist? Does it not? What about the tracks? Do we're looking exist? at the map um, yeah. on our devices of what is the current map and we're looking out the window all the time There's it, saying, oh, there's meant to be a track on the left and one on the right. And we verify as we're going along, does that exist? So it means we're slowing down and hunting for things that might be minor little tracks. And then we have to document and um, so there update in lies if it whether does or you doesn't enjoy exist. doing that on the road or not. Yeah. <laughs> when you know you're on a time frame of yeah, limited days to get to Sydney, and that really slows us down. We also then had fire warnings um, just coming out of Perth um, in early December, and that completely changed some of the plan that we had in mind and the reality of going as far south as Esperance and um, around my favourite national park, Fitzgerald River National Park, which I still haven't got to the centre and the east side of. That went out the window because it all got closed again, where it had been open just a few weeks before. 
So so managing all of those complexities, we just got in the car and turned on the ignition and went. <laughs> oh, uh, nose. And and you know we just headed headed south out of Perth and and down down the way to Williams and um, which is you know just down the main road and then across to Narragin and Harrowsmith. So what 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 we were trying to do at this point was get some way down the coast, uh, some way down WA, so that we could head basically due east. Um, without doing too many deviations and so Williams, Narrage and Harrowsmith was kind of the way. Towards Ravensthorpe. Yeah, yeah and it, it, it allowed us to go through Lake Grey so I'm just having a look at our tracking map on the on the system and then. And this one I found that track. Outside of Lake Grace you know there was there was a track on the on the map that went kind of in the right direction but it sort of stopped and did some wobbles and we didn't really know a hundred percent if it went all the way through but looking at the topography and looking at the lay of the land, it, it really did look like it was going to go through. And for those of you that are interested, it's out of Newdigate and you, you're heading east um, and you Via get the to, Frank Harm to National Lake Park. King. Yep. And the, you're on the Lake King Norseman Road and that's all great. And then you get to a little turn off uh, and, it, and it disappears up Lake King Norseman Road. Um, and we had, a, we had a little minor track that shot out of there and went a certain way, but then it stopped. Um, and so we weren't even, it did stopped on our map, it stopped on every map we could look at. So we had no real idea, but there was a track in front of us. And so we took it, we took it to, <laughs> with we, the trailer, with the trailer, with everything else. And we decided, and we, we decided, yeah, it was quite sandy, but we decided that, um, it was there and just purely by looking at the mapping lines and the mapping data, um, it looked reasonable that it should make it all the way through to the little minor track that was going to be on the other side. Yeah, so, we should mention there's we had a track note for the Duns track, yeah. which was just lying a little bit to the south um, of where we east, were. Yeah. Of where we were, and I had a lot of information about that track because that sits on our system. Um, and of course, we're offline at this point, and you can read all our, all our track notes offline and read all the information about the conditions and look at the photos. Um, and it gets pretty gnarly in the in the um, rainy time. But in the summer, it, and the, what we were looking at, it looked all pretty good and dry. Even the so-called low wet areas were already dry where we were. And that would be your main concern because um, that would get quite boggy and slow you down and make a lot of diversions and make it a bit hard towing the trailer and not making it a shortcut. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this shortcut did have some curlies in it. There was a river crossing, two creek crossings, according to the topography on the map. Oh, and yeah. it was going through a big, large, white section of the of the map which basically indicated that there wasn't much detail about the uh, underlying ground and and bits and pieces it wasn't showing sand but it was showing you know lakes and lots of salt lakes in the area and rivers and, and crossings so you know towing the trail and all that sort of stuff on an unmarked road um unmapped road i shouldn't say it was certainly there it existed it was a bit sandy in patches and stuff but the usual nothing you nothing you shouldn't be able to hand tires down and go through and sure enough, it came out the other side. So EO Topo 2024 road update one was already locked in, a new road that we didn't have before. Um, we'd also noticed as we were traveling across there that there was a few intersections that I didn't expect that were there. Um, so we made sure that we, we made some notes about that, that made sure that we'd make sure that we do a, a satellite check of that area as well on the mapping system as we went. And then we went in. Um, so we spent our first night, uh, I sort of skipped the first night, um, just off the Holland track um, at uh, what was that place Jam called? Jam Patch. Patch. Jam Patch, just off the Holland track. Um, it was it was a great little camp. They had some great trees. It wasn't far off the road, but it's a really quiet road. And when I mean the road, the Holland track comes north south, and and that's sort of the major road that we were on goes uh, east west. So there was hardly any traffic. We were I don't know two or three hundred, four hundred. Yeah, not far. Yep, yep. Off, off the, the main off road. the main road. We didn't hear anything much all night. It was a lovely camp. Um, There's photos on our socials from that, from yeah. around that time. Yeah, yep. so that was the 10th to the 11th of December. Um, our next our next target point, just doing all that Newdigate Road and all that uh, un unknown road around Lake Grace and all of that, that was um, a target of Peak Charles. And Peak Charles is a national park and it has a number of um, out rocky granite outcrops and there's a this Peak Charles in particular is um, in the national park and it has facilities and the camping is free and doesn't need booking and it has a fantastic <laughs> summit hike and um, 
that's what we were going for. That sounded like a perfect location. There is an alternative way to get to the Peak Charles National Park from um, Lake King, and that's what the, the back road is. What David was referring to is the, the track that we took was not along that main road that takes you sort of up north and brings you back around in. So we've gone across through the guts, through the, the southern eastern section to come in the back way. And there certainly weren't any tracks and there were no other vehicles around. And um, we were really happy to score the perfect campsite at this facility with a, with a hike and it was all documented. It was really lovely. And again, if you, if you want to, we, we, had a, we had a great walk up there. Stayed, we stayed one night. We, we, we could have stayed we ages. Could have, we could have beautiful. stayed ages, but you know, we had this timeline to, oh no, we stayed two nights because we had to stay one. Oh yeah, the night we so came we stayed, in, it was the night quite we came hot in, in the it was afternoon. quite hot in the afternoon and we, so we decided that hike. we couldn't hike yeah, then. Yeah. Oh, but we left the next day. We still left the so next day. So we did day. a morning hike. Yeah, so we, we, yeah. we spent a few hours just kicking around in the campsite and, um, and checking things out, the signboards and the, and, and the features and the and bits and pieces like that. A couple of other people arrived. Um, that, that camped near us uh, and they were nice and we had a chat to them. Um, they were actually a full drive tour operator. From yeah, they Perth. just finished they a tour. Lovely. They just finished a tour. I think it was Get Lost Tours. I yeah, think Get Lost Tours. Get Lost so tours. shout out to them. They're so really nice yeah, people. Shout out to them. Um, <laughs> we, we swapped some merchandise in the car park and had a chat uh, and that was all quite lovely. And then so the next morning arrives and we, we did the Peak Charles Climb. Excellent place to go. Wonderful thing to do. Uh, I expect that have a look at all the site, all of our there's socials. There's a video on there's our videos YouTube. videos on our YouTube channel. There's, there's, and there's uh, on our other feeds and stuff. You'll get snippets of, of, of that climb and day, and that was terrific. We came back to the car, and something that was new and luxurious to us was we had a shower. Um, <laughs> so that 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 had to make a special mention on our on our feed uh, because we haven't we had whilst we've had car showers before, we haven't had them so luxuriously set up um, that we have with the electric hot water, uh, the gas hot water system. So the next day, you know, we headed out of there and we went, we went along um, past this uh, Moya Rock. So if anyone's ever, ever been in WA and done any touring around WA, one of the things that you can find sometimes at some of these big rocks are these little um, walls made of stone, you know, and they've been made by people. Um, and what they basically do is you get your big, your big rock and then around the edges of the big rock, they build these walls uh, to make channels. And they basically channel, as the rain comes down, the water runs down the rocks, that goes into these channels, and then they go all the way into a feed pipe and then out to a big water tank. And Moya Rock had one of these, and we didn't even know it had one of these, so we, we stopped in there, and it had, um, it was just a nice place. We took some drone footage and, and bits yep. and pieces like that. The unfortunate reality was, you know, and we said earlier that we wanted to try and avoid Norseman, but um, it was blatantly nice. obvious that yeah. we were heading towards Norseman. One, there was fires to the east of Norseman, and we wanted to do the Overland Telegraph track because we decided we'd done it a number of times, but it was better than the high. It's better than the highway, in my opinion. Uh, it's much slower. It's sandy. It's horrible. It's dirt. It's cor you know, it's, there's not much corrugations, but it's just it's a fairly rough old track. But I'd prefer that than the Tar Bitumen Highway any time. I feel much more confident when I don't have trucks coming at me at 100 k's an hour. Um, <laughs> You know, and it's just much more quiet, much more of our, our mode. But we'd heard about these fires, so we didn't really know. So we knew we had to go to, to Norseman, one, to get a little bit of fuel, and two, just to catch up on the fire situation and determine yep. which way we were going to go. So yep. we got to Norseman, it was about lunchtime, wasn't it? Yeah. And the wonderful people at the Visitors Information Centre there um, very quickly got the gist of our mode of travel and seriously... Um, double checked whether the fires that <laughs> how's this the fires had closed the air highway and every single camp along the air highway between Norseman and Valadonia they said was none of those rest areas were open for camping they said they'd put roadblocks on them it was just too much of a fire risk um, on the southern side of the highway um, to Which is where even to let people goes. stay overnight so what they were doing was they roadblocked every single rest area said no camping and um, so travellers just had to go all the way through because it was quite unknown. This this mm. fire had been happening for a couple of days and that's why we knew of it actually when we left Perth. But we thought by the time we sort of got to the area, it might have dissipated and been under control. But they were conducting their um, their final their final containment. Um, 
So that was too high a risk. We we did go and have a little look at the beginning of the track that goes. And they closed it just like half a kilometer out of Norseman. Yeah. That the, the the heritage trail had been closed, and and we're talking about. 200 kilometres away from the fire front. So yeah. they've had a fairly concerted effort to shut everything. Yeah. And so we, we absolutely double checked. and So we found obvious. ourselves on the highway. We found ourselves on the <laughs> bloody highway. From Norseman. And not only were we on the highway, but it was like it was late afternoon. two or three o'clock in the afternoon by now because we did a bit of shopping, did our fuel, did our bits and pieces. And then we, we were just going to go down the road to the we were, heritage track. And, st- and we, had, we were going to go halfway along the telegraph track and stay there, so do another 40 or 50 K. So then we were left with the proposition that we knew we couldn't camp until the other side of Baladonia. And so yep. that was a couple of hundred Ks, I think, from, from, from where we were. But um, as it turned out, and so we yeah, we decided we we just had to hightail it. It was oh. middle of summer; the sun was setting late. Uh, for for those of us in in WA, um, you know, the the sun goes the sun comes up early and still sets at a normal time. Unlike when you get over east and the sun sets at like nine p.m. Yeah. Um, so, but we, we still had a few good sun hours. I think it was like a seven or eight eight seven thirty eight o'clock sunset, even in even in WA, even as we we're traveling east because of the timing adjustments and, and the sun going down quicker mm. because we're further east and all that sort of thing. Um, so we decided that we at least had to shoot past Baladonia, uh, which was some 200 Ks. And we did. We shot past Baladonia and we found uh, Afghan rock. And we weren't 100% sure what Afghan rock was. I'd seen it on the map. It's, it's sort of southwest, uh, sort of, sorry, northeast of um, Baladonia, the roadhouse itself. There's a track behind the rest area, um, which is on the, on the main road. It's a rest area that looks like you wouldn't want to stay. It's just two bins and a bit of tar. But there were people staying <laughs> there. People staying in it. But literally just to it the was west the first, of the It gate. was basically the first unblocked campsite yep. or roadside P-Bay yep. um, from um, Baladonia. Uh, it was only some, you know, Five, five or six k's from Baladonia. Anyway, so we drove to the rest area, decided we couldn't stay there, saw the road to um, the, the rock. There was, I think, was there a gate there? So there is a big gate. It's just about 50 metres to the west there of the, the roadside there. rest area. And on the gate, when we first went past it, we presumed that it was saying private property keep out. But I actually got out of the car and went up close and had a good read of what the gate said. And it just says, close the gate behind you, Afghan rock, rah, rah, rah. Enjoy your stay. So it is um, um, accessible. Accessible it or, is, or it open. Is on, it is on property. It is yeah. it, um, it is on property and it is in an, uh, an Aboriginal area, not an, an, an Indigenous protected area. Um, but the signs basically said, you know, close the gate, no shooting, no pets, uh, enjoy your stay sort of thing. So we shot up there and spent the night there and it was, it was quite a nice spot. So it's not a large rock. It's nothing quite significant. It's literally like a um, It's a big a flat, flat rock. plateau. It's not a high rock. It's a big flat exactly. plateau of rock. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there was no there was no other underlying features or anything special about it. it was we were able to get to about two kilometres back off the road, had some nice trees, beautiful yeah. sunset. I mean, it was very pretty. Um, but yeah, it's not really a major point of interest, but it was an opportunity for us to get off the highway. And surprisingly, that first part of the drive, David was saying, oh, this is really nice driving on the air highway. <laughs> no, I wasn't. You were. Was there was I? no one around. Oh, it was dead quiet. Fire, yeah. I think because of the fire. And it was late in the afternoon yep. when we were heading across and all that. So we didn't yep. actually encounter too many trucks and things. But, you know, I knew we had <laughs> another three or four days of the tar to go. So I was yeah. biding my time and biding my tongue trying to think about that. So we stayed the Afghan rock. Then the next day, you know, in our usual work mode, we had a few thought bubbles that we wanted to check out a few places along the way and and do some uh, updates. Um, you know, that that day, where where we what did we drive through on that day? Uh, lots of rock holes, oh, Kaiguna, and um, you know, rest areas. I'm looking at our mapping line, and all I can see is these little blobs in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out of every red roadside P bay. So every single rest area that there existed, we stopped, and oh, and also all the the rocks and the caves and the point of interest features in the track. So everything got verified, photographed, wrote a comment, did an update. And the way we do a lot of that updating is literally through the public app that everybody else has access to use. The Explorers Traveler app is fully interactive. So um, we're just using the same tools that if you own the app, you can use, and that is 
just tapping the add photo, tapping the updates and putting a comment in. And those things are the interactive features that make it really useful for the next traveller. But the difference that um, we have is the ability, obviously, to verify the positioning and moving it, um, checking the actual tracks, which is on the base map below it. And so, of course, we're doing all of that as well. So, yeah, yeah, always working. And, yeah, so looking at blobs in and out on roads. I just remembered that after we left Afghan Rocks and before the actual Baladonia station, uh, the, old, the old station or the telegraph station, um, I wanted to find the start of the Overland Telegraph track because most of the times I'd done it before, I'd come down the Dundas track, which is from Valedonia Roadhouse, and you head south. Now, they've closed that road. Oh, but yeah. They haven't, I don't know whether they've really closed the road to the Overland Telegraph track, but there is a thumping great big road close sign right there at Valedonia Roadhouse on, the, on that road going south now. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I thoroughly found the Overland Telegraph track start, which is just near Old Valedonia Telegraph Station, and I'd driven past it and I'd looked for it in years gone by, coming back and forth from Sydney a few times. Um, and I just, for the life of me, could never see it. I did see that some one of our other users had uploaded a track log with it on. So I thought, oh, it's got to be here. I had a look on satellite. I could see where it roughly was. Uh, so we made sure we found that. So there's a little blop on, if it, on our tracking map. If anyone wants to have a look at our tracking map, you can actually see our full journey. Um, if you zoom all the way day in. by okay. day yeah. every every place we stop every little roadside pea bay we pull into you can see the whole lot um, on our tracking map which is available on the website um, and I'm sure we've got links from our socials to that tracking map of our active tracking so you can jump on the website and go to the tracking page you'll also be able to find us in the recent updates because we're uh, pretty much running it all the time so we, you know, we went to Wobbler Rest Area, Taylor Mays Campsite. We found all sorts of different places, a um, couple of pea bays. Look, a lot of the pea bays have been massively upgraded um, since our last trip across the highway. There's a lot of new facilities, upgraded toilet facilities, but a lot of them now have a rest area at the front. And, and the for those that actually want to explore out the back and get off the highway, there's a lot of tracks leading out the back. Um, I mean, there always was that sort of thing but there seems to be a lot more rest yeah. areas than there were pre-COVID uh, I think COVID has really there changed was a lot, there was a lot of rest lot areas of there was a lot of rest areas but they didn't have very good facilities or, or they didn't have you know bins and that sort of stuff and, and now they sort of do one of the things that we decided while we we're doing some of this work was because if you don't really know a lot most rest areas in most states during COVID and post-COVID haven't been yet necessarily changed back is that most rest areas have been designated as an overnight camping or overnight stopping spot whether it's a camping spot or not is dubious but you're meant to be able to do an overnight stop in any one of these rest areas um, as a driver as reviver. a driver reviver kind of function yeah. and that's since covid was had started um, some of that hasn't been reverted yet so a lot of our a lot of our rest areas and p bays on the, on the system had been designated as sort of free camps which you know, we've never really been that happy with because they're not really um, they're really a rest area um, and so one of the things we started doing as we were coming across the air highway was making sure that we designated the pea bay or roadside rest area as a rest area. And then if we thought it was worthy and there was a camp out the back, we would drive out the back and we would place the markers for those campsites off the road and out the back. So if you're using the system coming across the air highway and you want to know where a decent spot might be, um, they'll still be marked as camp free camps or campsites off on our system but they'll be away from the rest area or behind the rest area um, so that's a, a new thing or something that we've just adjusted slightly in the way that we we do our rest area p bay designation so mm. you know. but there's more than that too we tend to only bother putting the free camp marker um, a camping marker if it actually is a spot that would be worth camping at <laughs> yes. like it's not just yeah. it's not a gravel pit it's just not some dodgy thing well, some gravel pits are okay some gravel but... pits are okay but it's not just some dodgy thing on the side of the road where there's a fence and there's lots of toilet paper and rubbish and you know we we, we wouldn't mark those as camps we want to make it so that there's some trees hopefully there's some trees some protection just some shelter from the noise and and a little bit of privacy yeah. and a little bit of security for your vehicle so you know some of the rest areas are literally just turnouts that get your wheels off the main road and they're a rest area. We don't want to make that a camp. That would be designated as a, as a rest area only. But if there is a track that goes out the back and gets you out away from that over a hill or, or, or just 
a few hundred meters off the track and it's pleasant enough yep. then we would mark that, we'll as a, that as a camp, as a camp. camp so marker. that just verifies what we're doing with the markers yeah mm. so you know you'll keep looking at us going in and out in and out marking free camps or not free camps at some of these spots and one of the other things as we drove past or into Cocklebitty, we knew we had a, a little bit of work to do because for some reason we didn't have the, the, the road to Capstan Cave, uh, wasn't showing up on the map. Um, the icon was there. The icon was the there. The track to Cocklebitty well, there was, two, was there. There was actually two icons for Capstan Cave, the old oh. geoscience one and oh, yeah, the new Explorers one that, that we'd found through satellite research. So we should mention that. So there are <clears throat> quite a lot of um, outdated maps that are using the old geoscience um, data for a lot of the nama holes and caves and, and um, these features still in existence on maps that are actually wrong because of the GPS inaccuracy in those days perhaps or just the method of the surveying that was used in the original days. And so this is sort of propagated across more modern maps. And so one of the things we're doing is we're trying to reposition and get exactly verification of the exact location of where these places really are because everyone today has got devices that have um, you know modern GPS in them which are mm. a lot more accurate and then of course if you're using a very highly detailed map such as our EO Topo map means you can zoom right in and you'll see it's significantly off location if that isn't in the right spot so we're trying to fix everything that we come across and this was one in particular well, yeah, the, ori mentioned. the original marker was one and a half kilometers from the actual position of the that's of the a thing. huge inaccuracy <laughs> and so yeah. in in our older map we actually had the old marker still on there and you know one of the things i wanted to make sure was that we we, we covered that one off so we drove out to capstan cave so that we uh, to to the marker that we knew was on the map and um and we found a track out there and it, and it wasn't complicated it wasn't wasn't hard at all it was just that it hadn't been done um thoroughly in the past so you know topo 2024 yeah. has that update uh, attached to it now as well so these are the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis you know we then had it headed out from there and within 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 four kilometers we'd headed south into a bush camp around about the Mara El Elven cave now if I haven't said that right then too bad because that's what it's called in my opinion um Mara El Elven yeah El Elven El Elven yeah, yeah okay <laughs> down there um, and again, you know, we've, we've gone in there and we've seen the cave, uh, which is a, a great big hole in the ground. Um, it would be an awesome one to go into if you could. Uh, it's fenced off, it's fairly unsafe, uh, and it's a long drop in. You would need some serious equipment to get in there. Mm. But we also drove out the back of that and found um, a decent camping spot. In fact, we stayed there. We stayed there for that night. That was our fourth night, being the 13th of December. You know, um, and then we did some great stuff. You know, you're coming across from there, you go to um, through the border. Uh, it's I have to mention Cornelius, oh, Cornelius, the Belgium the cyclist. Belgian cyclist. <laughs> so look, you know, <laughs> we're cyclists and we've got our bikes, even though they're only our mountain bikes, we're just up on top of the camper trailer, so they're in view. And anyway, we're stopped at one of these rest areas along the air highway and we'd seen this cyclist. We'd driven past him some and he's support. got these he's on his own he's got no support vehicle he's 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 um got two big pannier packs on either side of his bike it's like a gravel bike and a he's in the headwind and yeah. we're going you poor guy <laughs> he's got his head down and he's churning away and we end up stopped at a rest area and he comes along and i've go david i've got to give him some water so i've, I've given him some water because i know what that's like you always want water when you're on the bike. You can never carry enough because it's quite heavy. So I could see you and only he's unsupported, two so models. he's doing yep. hundreds of kilometres a day without support. So know. then I start having a chat to him and I find out, you know, he's got a foreign accent, but he's speaking English quite well. He's Belgium. We've come across a lot of Belgium. He's got to be foreign. Before. He's driving. He's <laughs> cycling across the air highway Trays in the middle of, of summer. summer. Yeah. <laughs> So I asked him, why? Why did you choose summer to come across the, the air highway? And he goes, because I hate Belgium winter. <laughs> Good enough reason. That's quite funny. And then I gave him some food and then I found out that he's um, vegan, which was handy because what I was offering him was also vegan, so it wasn't inappropriate. So we had a good little chat. And would you believe the following day, well, we drove, we, we, we'd we driven, drove off. We'd we'd driven and we saw him again and he overtook at, at, us. No, we saw him again at Madra Pass. We pulled in. Was, was it He'd Madra done Pass? over 180 kilometres on, on yeah, the previous day because on we'd, his bike. We'd camped and 
then we'd done our road research that we do all the next day, <laughs> moving along fairly slowly. <laughs> And bugger me, this guy rode past us. So, you know. <laughs> this is an example of our mad dash to Sydney of how slow we're really going, that a push biker <laughs> in summer can race us and beat us to the but, end point. Yeah, over hundreds of kilometres. It was quite hilarious. So, yeah, he was, he was worth a mention. Well done remembering that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, Madra Pass, that was, was it Kaiguna? I can't remember exactly which one. It was one of those. It was Madra Pass or Kaiguna, one of the two that we saw him at. Uh, and that was and that was hilarious because, as I say, when we do hit the road, we drive as fast as we possibly can to get between one location and the next. But wow, that was that was cool. Then obviously, you know, we got to Eucla and bought a village and the quarantine checkpoint, and that was um, uneventful. For that our was direction. a bit uneventful for our direction. We didn't have to do anything other than just drive through. Uh, one of the things we did want to do was try and have a look down at the back of the. Um, the checkpoint and the camp camping area there, we saw that there was a track down uh, to the coastline and it, we thought that'd be that'd be pretty cool. So we drove down there and it was interesting because we got to a, like a big stone can that was marking the, 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 the WASA border. And, you know, if I think we did a bit, was there a social video about that again with us doing that? I don't know whether, I don't know, it, got I don't know whether it got published we, we or not, but we, we took some videos <laughs> and bits and pieces of us um, walking on each side of the border. I think Michelle was in WA and I was in South Australia and I was wondering how she could hear me because she was like two and a half hours of uh, time difference from me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, it was two, was two and a half at that time, isn't it? Because of some, I can't remember. But it was a massive time difference, <clears throat> you know, and she was in a whole different world, And uh, but I could hear her quite clearly. Anyway, do, so do, do, do. Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of fun. So we, we drove down and had a bit of a walk around there, the Wilson Bluff Cliffs. And, and, and a look down the coast in either direction and flew some drone and got some footage. And bits Absolutely and gorgeous. Yeah, it was a great So we've spot. come to the Nullarbor many times before, like far too many, but this was the first and only time we've ever seen it with no wind. Oh, yeah, no And it wind. was sunny and, no, and, and just hardly any beautiful. Swell it was amazing. So we did actually spend a fair bit of time exploring the coastal part here. So this is off the air highway, not at any of the rest areas. We've come right down to the coast. And um, basically, a border village. We've come to the coast, picked up a track, and we've driven east until we picked up the air highway again as it gets to scenic lookout, uh, 13 kilometer peg. So that's 13 kilometers from the border um, that we've rejoined Is it the highway. Yeah, it's 13. I've, okay, yep. I'm, that's why I've got glasses because it looks like <laughs> 131. <laughs> uh, it wasn't 131 <laughs> peg, it was only 31 <laughs> peg. Um, and we drove uh, along there um, out to Lookout 3, which is a little bit further along. And then we came across this track that was going down and we saw some roads into this uh, Nullarbor Wilderness Protection Area. And I think it's got another name in here, doesn't it? Wasn't it called something else? I don't know. No, it I had not have a It had right. a cliff marker and a few contour lines. It looked a bit sketchy. But we thought, oh, let's go and have an experiment. Let's go and have a look down there when we, when we saw the road. And... It was almost sunset. It was really late. It was getting late. Yeah, we were looking for a camp, it, it, to be honest. And so we thought we'll go down there and camp somewhere. And um, and sure enough, we shot over. We shot it down this track, and it was all fine. But well, it was pretty steep, and it was pretty rocky, and it was four wheel drivey. It was definitely four wheel drivey with the brand new camper. With the brand new camper trailer and all these bits and pieces. There is a video. Uh, I think that, that, yeah, that definitely a, that, that definitely made, made the social channels. It's on YouTube. Um, it's on YouTube and it's on uh, so that's the probably on Instagram YouTube. and all those other ones, yeah, but yeah. you'll never find it on those ones again. It's on the YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, it was one, it was an awesome campsite. Two, it was bit of, right bit to of, the water. bit of decent forward driving to get in and a bit more decent forward driving to get out. Um, I mean, uh, it'd be fine if you're in a vehicle on its own, but it's when you're towing and you've got an incline like that and it's all loose rocks and, and it was all, it was it was all washed out and... Yeah. And it was and, and the rig was new and and you don't want to hurt it. Yeah. Uh, so you're trying to be extra careful and that, that you know. Anyway, it anyway. was it was a great spot to camp. Wonderful spot. You get down really close to the water and as we said there was no swell and there was no no real wind so it was quite comfortable. Amazing. It was a great campsite. Amazing um, atmosphere. One of the one of the better ones. Yeah. Um moving across, you know, um from that day we drove a fair way that day. I remember that was one of the big days. We had to catch uh, up. We yeah. had to catch up. Oh, do you remember though when we went across into the, um, we changed from one shire to the other and all the lookouts to 
the cliffs then became quite established. So on the WA side, they're all a bit loose, nice and a bit natural. Looser. You yeah. Are, yeah, most of them are all on the South Australian side, all those cliff lookouts. But as we got closer to Yalatta and some of those yeah. areas, it changed. You weren't able to access some things. The things that were accessible were well, well formed. Yeah. Um, so that you they, look really they're trying to stop people venturing along the cliff edge um, and, and, enough, and accessing a hundred and, and, and going through a million different spots so they've really well defined some of those lookouts now they're all great to go to <laughs> you don't get much more from some of the other ones you may as well go to the designated nice flat easy drive in and drive out ones mm. um, <laughs> there is obviously some um, attempt at stopping uh, people driving along the cliff road and that sort of thing um, certainly once you hit your latter, um, and that's to be respected. And, you know, there's no reason not to do that. So we came shooting through and got through to Sejuna, and that, that was a quarantine checkpoint that actually yeah. had something. We lost some of our, we lost some of our produce there. Um, we oh, always, we handed it through. Oh, we, we handed knew it through. Exactly. We, always, we always try and manage. We know roughly what's coming, so we try and eat everything we've got. And I think we usually go through with one chilli or one lime or one something that we haven't been able to consume. So I think we lost a few bits and pieces, but, you know, uh, by then, some of that. But I'd made the most probably... massive guacamole with everything <laughs> yes. we could put yeah, in it. <laughs> well, yeah, we had a few cheap avocados that we decided we just had to mash up and and, and eat. And then we headed from after Sejuna. You know, again, getting later in the afternoon, we wanted to pitch a camp. And Paluvi Beach Camp area popped up on the map. It was a paid camp. Was it ten dollars? It's just a Shire um, booking situation through the Air Peninsula um, Council. So you've got to book and pay online. It's twenty dollars for uh, a single night's camp, that's for two adults. Um, I had read about it and knew that it was going to keep the riffraff away because it was a little bit um, sandy um, to get onto the beach to get into the camp. And um, it, wasn't sand, it wasn't hard to get into the camp at all, but the further up that you take the camp site, so you actually book them by softer. number, it gets yeah. softer and softer. Yeah. And um, I think we took site 14 or whatever and it had all been churned up by the previous caravan that obviously had pulled out in the morning. Well, they'd also dug a big hole for something. Oh, you know, there was kids digging holes. There's, there's, and... there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But, but that, was a, that, was a, that was a beautiful spot to camp, right on the beach, literally on the beach. The water laps up near your wheels at night time when the tide changes. It was, it was beautiful. It was good perfect. Sunsets. Good Good spot to stop. Yeah, a lot of people were there with kayaks or fishing. It's still peak school holidays then, so we had kids absolutely everywhere. Um, so it was a bit of a shock to the system, but um, they were really sweet. So it's fine. That was nice. And then in our usual way, you know, trying to head across without doing too much of the road, um, we came across through uh, Minipa, Wandina. Wandina and Kimba. Um, Kimba, had, Kimba had an awesome RV rest stop. I remember driving around. Wasn't that the one that had the really... Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I think Kimba has a... Well, not that we used it. Oh, yeah, Kimber, the Kimber Recreation Reserve RV 24-hour, 72-hour wow. or whatever rest stop. Wow. wow. And it's, it's free. all brand new it and it's free everything. and it, was, it had everything. We yeah. didn't stay there, but, you know, for those people that do like to stay at those RV stops, why would you not? If you, if, it's really good. If you're near Kimber, that's worth going to, that one. That was, that. you know, as we say, we don't necessarily stay at these, but we go through, we research them, we photograph them, we, we look at all of this stuff just like the caravan parks in towns and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it was it was good. It was notable. It was notable. Uh, notable enough that I've mentioned it to you. <laughs> we ended up pulling a, a fairly dirty camp, or not a dirty oh. camp, but a quick camp, Kimber East Rest Area. I was tired. I'd had enough. I had to get out of the car and stop driving. Uh, so it wasn't actually that far from Kimber. I had suggested to David, however, that... You go to that, Lake Giles, Gillies, we... Lake, Lake, this one up here, was it? Yeah. Lake... Lake Lake Gillies. There, there was a free camp before that that we should have taken, but it was a 10k diversion north off the air highway out to a salt lake called well, Lake Gillies. Is this and highway? when I'd mentioned it to Dave, he was going, oh, I'm not, I'm fine. I'm doing fine. I'm not ready to stop yet. And, and we'd then, been past so many good rest areas that we just assumed that the next rest areas marked on the map were probably going to be just as good. So the one that we pulled into that you said was, um, yeah, the... East Kimber East, Rest Area, Kimber East yeah. Ah, oh, Kimber East Rest Area, it was all right. It had a bit of few few trucks. We stayed there because we pulled in a bit early. I was, I'd actually, I, I was coming apart. So you we, came we apart, yeah. There, so it was about this point that we'd made a bit of a plan that David needed some rest. So we'd been pushing it, um, and he was getting tired. 
just day by day by day and said, I just can't keep this up. I need a bit of a break. And I have a cousin who lives in um, Port Elliot, which is near Victor Harbour. So I had been hoping I'd been able to squeeze in a quick visit there. So we decided that we could um, allocate two nights staying there there. and that would give David just some time just to not be on the road and just rest. Yeah, so, so we, we hightailed it down there. Yeah, so we did that. Stayed at Port Elliot. Was 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 lovely. Got out on the mountain bikes and did a tour through town. And oh, you went on the mountain bikes. I went horse riding. My cousin horse riding. Yeah, I, I went, has a rural property I went on the mountain there. bikes. Michelle went on the horses. Yeah. It was great. We had a, had a, had a couple of nights with family there, so that was great. And then um, uh, after we left there, headed up uh, in, towards Victoria, um, well, out of out of South Australia, Strathalbyn, um, and into a thing called Callington and then across towards Murray Bridge, which we didn't actually go into Murray Bridge. We skirted past Murray Bridge, I think, didn't we? Or were we on the outside? We oh, had that really were, awesome camp. Oh, yeah, no, we were right on the outside of Murray Bridge. At the State Forest. Yeah, Murray well, that was, that was a bit further on. That was, um, that was over here somewhere. Once we'd gone, actually, was it? Where is it? There, there you go. There we go. Yep. So we'd already, Something so bent. we'd gone Pound through Victoria. Bent. So we'd gone through... Owen, is it O-U-Y-N? And then, yeah, we went to uh, an area called Pound Bend, um, which was on the Murray uh, in w- in Victoria. And, wow, that was so nice. that We drove, we, we just pulled off the roadside onto a little dirt track and you can drive for a long, long way around the place. And it was, uh, it was great. There was large trees. Uh, the river was right there. It was flowing. It, it was a great spot to so stop. You- to find this spot on the map, you look for Wemen, W-E-M-E-N, on the map, and then you'll see the marker to Pound Bend on the Murray River. And literally, the tracks take you past unlimited numbers of beautiful bush camps. It wouldn't matter where you went. Like from the first section, the first 500 metres when we pulled in, we, we could have stopped there. It was perfect. But we had enough time up our sleeve that we thought we'd just keep driving around and around and around and around. And we did, and it just got better and better and better. Yeah. Massive big river red gum, so you've got to be careful about big limbs falling at night, widow makers. Um, and the spot that we did go to was very um, precarious for that. <laughs> <laughs> but we did find a spot. We're usually, we usually find ourselves in precarious tree overhanging <laughs> limb spots. I don't know why we do it to ourselves, but we seem to do it uh, all the time. And we get out and we look after we've set everything up and go, oh, look at that tree. But uh, We try hope, really hard, we try to, really avoid hard to avoid it, but sometimes we just get it wrong. So after that, the next day, uh, Houston, Val Reynolds, um, you know, getting back onto sort of major, major way, Darlington Narendra. Point, Narendra. Yeah. And then uh, we headed down towards Wagga and uh, we... We pulled a camp, um, which was probably one of the best camps we've had. Beavers Creek, Murrumbidgee Valley National Park. Um, it's behind a pea bay. There's a little grid. Um, there's no fence. There's a fence, but there's no gate. And, and there's a national and, and park a, sign. There is a national park sign. And, and, it's it's, welcoming. and it actually yeah. says camping on the sign and everything. So it was all completely legitimate. And it's behind the Berry Jerry rest area. Um, off the Stuart Highway, Sturt Highway, uh, and it's just just west of Wagga. Um, some I don't know uh, how far is that on the map? About five, ten. Blah, 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 I thought it was about forty k's. About forty k's. Yeah. About yeah. thirty, forty k's. Um, Before west, Wagga. West of yeah. Wagga, and it was fantastic. The river was the the creek. It's it's a feeder creek to the Murrumbidgee, uh, and it's called Beavers Creek, and it had a flow and it had some massive water. It was uh, really wide, probably, you know, eight, eight meters wide. And it had a constant flow. You could put a stick in and it would be gone. Yeah. Uh, it was really moving. But and that th- was also because of all the rains and the floods yeah. and the bits and pieces that have been happening over, over east. And um, we, we hadn't really seen it until then. And just the volume of water moving through there, you're yeah. thinking, wow, this is, this, is pretty, yeah. this is a pretty impressive amount of water. So we should mention here, look, look, we've been in living in WA for 23 years and whilst we travel all the time and explore, we haven't actually come in our vehicle into Victoria or New South Wales or Queensland for years. Although we have family over east and we will fly over for visits and what have you, we actually haven't been camping in this area for such a long time. And one of the big things that we've been watching on the weather for years is how the weather over east has changed. I mean, for those listening that live that way um you've been going through fires floods 
unbelievable amounts of rain and we sit in WA and the weather is very predictable yeah. where it does not 32 rain. 32 degrees every summer. day with the sun. Yeah. <laughs> and having that um, concern about where we've been going to camp and, and where the tra- whether the tracks are open and are accessible and what condition there are has been something that's been concerning us a little bit um, because we don't really plan and we just follow our nose. This particular spot, um, you definitely needed a four-wheel drive and oh, yeah. you could see it had been underwater through recent flooding, um, but probably multiple floodings, the whole area. It was um, like a green carpet. Yeah, but made it beautiful for us. But on the way out, it was really quite tricky to sort of navigate the way out. The track was um, furrows of wheel tracks. And big, deep. big, big ruts and cut And out. massive big um, dip ups. We would have been better going out the way we came in, but we wanted to have a bit of yeah. a tour around and look at the other sites that were in there. But there was also a lot of overhanging trees. And because we carry the bikes on the roof of the camper trailer, the way David's got set up, there is just some low branches that occasionally he's got to go really cautiously through and there was one funny moment there that there was no point in filming it but it's memorable to us because to be able to get in i had to actually lift a tree trunk to enable the bike to go underneath and it was all twisting and turning um it was quite funny if it had been filmed it would just show you the length that we the reason it wasn't filmed the reason it wasn't filmed is that i was driving she was holding the tree so there you go there was no spare hand to film crew And, and it was a really, really worthwhile spot to go. So, um, so if you do the, need a four-wheel drive. If you're in that area and you've got a four-wheel drive, um, yeah, and the, and it's not <laughs> pouring with rain at the time, that's definitely worth a look at. So from there, you know, Wagga Wagga, yes, you know, straight up, oh, straight up, up the main road. It was very boring, uh, very unexciting, uh, all the way into Sydney, and um, you know, we stayed at my, at my brother's house near Penrith, and that was all wonderful. And you know, that's kind of the first part of our podcast that we wanted to cover you know we wanted to talk about how we how we spent all this time planning and then the plans all got changed and then a bit of a blow by blow on the 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 travel journey don't know whether that was exciting for you or not um to listen to but it was certainly fun we condensed you know 10 or 11 days into 40 or 50 minutes so i hope that wasn't too too much of a stress for you all but now you know we'd hit sydney it was christmas time with family um, we do have uh, a lot more to talk about for, from, from what happened after we got to Sydney and the, the time we spent in Sydney. We did some great walks and hikes and we'll talk about those in podcast number 12. Um, so with that all being said and us now sitting pretty in Sydney, we'll leave you there until next time we come out on the, on the podcast journey.